Now your mercy sustains my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, oh, what a day. You call my name. How many of you relate to this? I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your do this next one for any of you guys familiar with the old church hymns and all this we kind of took it and tweaked just tweaked it a little bit just a little bit Sorrow inside. 
trade is a gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. And now I'm so happy, no sorrow. for that light because I tell you what Jesus Christ is the light amen you may be seated hey good morning and welcome to church what do y'all think about the Christmas decorations man these look amazing I want to give a big thank you to Stephanie and to everyone who came out to, to serve yesterday and put these together you know like I told the church on Wednesday there's a great ministry opportunity that somebody could come into the church, maybe they're they're down and, and disheartened, and just the decorations could hopefully put them in the right spirit so that they could receive the word today. And so thank you to everyone who came out to put this together and make this possible. You guys are amazing. So we do want to welcome everyone to church this morning. We want to welcome our guests. If there is a guest here today, we'd ask that you grab the welcome card, fill that out. We have a gift that we'd like to put in your hands. If there's not a guest here today, or if someone is not sitting next to you, that's a guest. And as they come in today, as a member, let's remind them to grab that welcome card, fill that out so we can give them a gift. But right now, we do want to welcome everybody to church. So let's stand up. Let's welcome each other to church this morning. If you'll return to your chairs and let's remain standing as we go to the Lord in prayer. But I do want to welcome our online guests. If you are a first time guest of ours watching online, I'd ask that you go to bfchurch.com, click on that guest tab, fill out the information so that we can get to know you a little better. But right now, let's let's do go to the Lord in prayer. But I, I, I want to mention real quick, we have, y'all are familiar with Miss Camille Arms. She has been a, a member here for forever since the initiation of the church, but she's she's also served on our staff as our, our as our, our secretary here at the church. She felt the calling 
to go and serve with the IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force. And so she will be leaving in the next week or so. And we do want to lift her up in prayer that everything she does can, can be honoring to God and that she can be used she can be used by him in just a, a miraculous way. And so please be praying for her as you think about her. Be lifting her up, and let's lift her up and the service right now. Father God, we come to you right now. Lord, we lift our sister up to you. God, that as she's over there, fulfilling the calling that, that she has heard from you, God, that she would remember that you were near her. God, that everyone around her will know that there's something different, and that difference is you. God, we thank you for the time that we've had with her here on the staff, serving serving you here at this church. And we know that she's going to fulfill a much greater calling over there. We thank you for that. God, just as we lift her up, Lord, we lift everybody up here today. God, that the, the message that you have, God, that we can hear that, we can apply it to our lives. We thank you for all that you're doing for this church for this body of believers. God, if there's someone here today who doesn't know you, who's never trusted you as their savior, God, today would be the day. God, that you'd speak to them in a way that they know it's you and that they can't deny that. God, that they'd surrender their hearts to you this morning. God, for those who, who already know you, but they know that there's an area in their life that they, they need to work on. God, speak to them this morning. Speak to us. God, if there's something we need to fix, and we can fix that. We can get that right before you. Father, we love you. We do love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Shine through the shadows, burn. 
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every. Right. 
Love y'all. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Gary Juarez. I I think I'm still. I think I'm still the pastor of Believer's Fellowship. <laughs> I want to thank you for your prayers, calls, texts, support. I want to thank uh, Pastor Matt, Brother Jimmy, Brother Mike, the staff, for just, uh, just doing what God has called you to do. Medical update. Um, so went into surgery really not knowing what to expect and uh, <clears throat> came out. Well, before that backtrack, they said, well, you know, you're going to be here a couple, three days, whatever, whatever. Okay, no problem get out of surgery, finally get out of, you know, recovery and all that. And they said, okay, you're going home. I'm like, no, they said, to, no, you're going home. I was like, all right, I'm, I'll go home. Um, so went home, you know, pro healing process and all that. Uh, went to the doctor uh, last Tuesday, was it last Tuesday, two Tuesdays ago? Two Tuesdays ago, and, and the doctor says, hey, you got the biopsy back. Um, all came back negative for cancer. Uh, so that's a praise. Um, 
he said it. And honestly, he goes, maybe, maybe we, we went a little too far with, uh, and too, maybe we were too, too extreme with, with removing. I said, Doc, you did exactly what you were supposed to do. Uh, I don't second guess you, and I hope you don't second guess yourself. I said, you know, I, I trust you, and I will continue to trust you to do what you feel is required. And I said, I'm glad you took out what you needed to. They came back, and it said it was negative, so praise God. So just uh, know that I love you, and it's so good. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you this morning. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to make it. Um, but I'll tell you this. I hadn't preached in about three weeks, so we're going to be here for a minute. Um, I am just so honored and privileged to be your pastor. And, and that time away, man, I missed y'all so much. I really did. I missed y'all. You know, I always say that Sophia is my metronome. She, she's my balance, right? She's the one that keeps me. But my calling is here. And I love y'all so much. And, and so know that from the bottom of my heart that I love you. And, and I don't ever want to take for granted the trust that you have given me to stand behind this pulpit. Um, so I want to thank you for, for all of that. Um, you know, I am honored and I'm privileged. And, and with that, I'm never, I'm not going to hesitate to speak on moral issues. I'm not going to stop being convictional about sin while being compassionate towards sinners. That's why we hold to the inerrancy of author and authority of Scripture that God has created the sanctity of life, gender as determined by God in the womb, marriage as one man and one woman, the, exclusi the exclusivity of salvation of, by faith alone in Christ alone. Our aim at Believer's Fellowship is to live on mission, going deep into God's Word and applying it in our lives. We are to, me, to remain resolute in our identity as ambassadors for Christ. Our allegiance is to the scripture and the gospel. It's not a political affiliation that defines our characteristics as Christians. Martin Luther declared this, my conscience is captive to the word of God. This commitment calls us to boldly proclaim the gospel. It requires us to courageously speak God's word without falling into the trap of aligning our faith with the political agenda. That's why it's important that I speak on the topic of politics today and how we can easily divide families and churches. We've all seen the rhetoric. We've all heard the rhetoric. We might even have spoken the rhetoric. How does that glorify God? How does anything that we've heard over the last six months, the last two years, the last four years, the last eight years, the last 10 years, 12 years, how does that, any of that glorify God? You know, today there's, there's a mixed bag of emotions. There are those that are happy, and then there are those that are not. It's okay to feel those feelings. What matters is how we respond as Christ followers. Because for many, politics have become very personal. It's people having to navigate how to treat and respond to their friends, to their coworkers, to their family members who do not agree with how they voted. Now, you're free to disagree with me. All I ask is that you do so courteously. Because my goal is not to please you. My aim is to please an audience of one. So let me begin by saying that I am a pastor, not a political pundit. 
While I do follow politics with great interest, my calling is to be a pastor. That word pastor means shepherd. As such, that is to spiritually lead and scripturally feed the sheep God has given me. 1 Peter 5, 2 says, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sort of gain, but with eagerness. I understand, I, believe me, I heard it, I saw it, I witnessed it. People sit, men of God, sitting behind, the, standing behind a pulpit, saying this and that, dividing people. It breaks my heart when I see the church being used for that. It breaks my heart that knowing that in two weeks when we break bread for th- with our families for Thanksgiving, that families are going to be separated. I thought we learned from COVID, people. I, I thought we learned from COVID. But the, polit- but the politics of today and the rhetoric of today divide us when it's the word of God that unites us. I recognize that politics is a sensitive topic. So I wanna make an appeal to everyone that's here today. I wanna appeal for us to hear what the Bible has to say. Let's Let's not look at the Bible through the lens of, of being a Democrat or through the lens of being a Republican because we can all take scripture out of context and make it in line with our arguments. As Christians, we don't change scripture to align to our lifestyle. Our lifestyle must align to scripture. 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What we believe about God's word will determine how we view the world around us. What we believe about God's word will determine how we view the world around us. If our worldview is not rooted in God's word, it will come from the world. Because here's the truth. Only a personal conversion through Jesus, not a political conviction, would lead to lasting change. So here's some principles from Ecclesiastes that will keep us grounded. First, reflect godly wisdom. Isn't that something we need? Now, people can have wisdom, but wisdom is different than godly wisdom. Because I could, I could have wisdom. I'm sure there are a lot of here that, that have wisdom in some area or that's your area of expertise or, or, or that's your trade, that's where you have wisdom. But godly wisdom is different. Godly wisdom is different. Ecclesiastes 8.1 says, who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern, stern face to beam. This is out of the NLT. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze and interpret things. Wisdom lights up a person's face, softening its harshness. So Solomon gives us two rhetorical questions right off the the bat. Who is like the wise man who knows the interpretation of a matter? Who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? It's the same thing Joseph asked in Genesis. Do not interpretations belong to God? Daniel in Daniel 2, 28. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So let's embrace the invitation that we find in James. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But so often, God is the last person we look to for wisdom. We look to it in our politics. We look to it in in, in man. Man is not going to give us the wisdom, the godly wisdom that we need. It can only come from God. But it's almost like we, it's almost like one of the presidents died on the cross for our salvation. That's how people really view. The politics of today, like, like whoever's going to be at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is going to lead you into eternity. He's going to come down with the trumpets. 
that cat's not, none of them cats is going to be there. They might be following them, but they're not leading the charge. So we got to have and reflect godly wisdom. Psalm 34, 5 says, they looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. You see, even a stern face is softened when God shines his face upon us. Listen to Proverbs 15, 13. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Regardless if your candidate won or your candidate lost, my question to you this morning, do you have a faith face or a fear face? Is it stern toward those who voted different than you? Or is it soft toward the people made in the image of God? You see, godly wisdom informs us on how we are to respect government. So that's the second principle that we get out of Ecclesiastes. And this is a, a long verse. We're going to be uh, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8, verses 2 through 9. And so this is what God's word says. It says, I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to, relieve, to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every delight, though a man's trouble is heavy upon him. If no one knows what will happen, how can, or who can tell him when it will happen? No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death. There is no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. All this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. Now that's a lot. But what does all that mean? That means we are to submit to the governed authority over us. Recognizing what verse 6 says that there's a proper time and procedure for every delight. Daniel's a good example of this. You remember when, when Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and, and the whole group uh, uh, were, were taken out of Jerusalem to, 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 to Babylon and then the, the leaders of Babylon were like, you're going to eat this meat and then what did Daniel say? Well, no, hey, I respect your authority but can, can you just give us some vegetables? You remember that? He, he did that. He respected their authority but he was like, hey, can we compromise? Instead of this, can I have that? You see, he maintained his convictions, but he was also respectful to the governing authorities and was willing to suffer. Romans 13, 1 and 2 say this, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those with which exist are established by God. Let me stop there for a minute. So... God has placed who he has placed in the White House now. God has placed who's going to be in the White House come January 20th. But if you go to the end of the book, all that has to happen for us to get to where we need to go. So, so if, if, if you think that, well, my candidate's in office now, so things are going to get better. No, I, I've read it. It, it don't get better. It, it doesn't get better. And, and for those that are saying, well, my candidate's in office now, it's going to get worse. You're right. It's going to get a lot worse, but not for the reasons you think they are. You see, we want to divide ourselves between red and blue, Democrat and Republican. God doesn't see that. God sees lost and saved, believers and unbelievers, the apostate. That's who God sees. And that's the lens we need to see. Not that, 
that person's a Democrat. I'm not, I'm not sharing a, a, a lunch table with that person. I'm not breaking bread with that person. I'm not even going to say hello to that person. Like you saying hello and not saying hello is going to ruin their day. What we need to be worried about is where are they going to spend eternity? You talk about ruining somebody's day. That could ruin their eternity. And more importantly, you got to answer to why you didn't share the gospel with that lost person. Are you going to stand before God and say, well, they voted a, a different than me? Is that what it matters? Is that truly what matters? Is that you're only going to share the gospel with those that think like you? That breaks my heart. Because we are ambassadors for Christ. We're to witness for Christ. You see, so you have Daniel, who's a good example. But when God and government conflict, we're to obey God as Peter and John did in Acts 5, 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. One way we do that, one way we respect our government is by voting. You know, we, 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 we did a series on stewardship. Y'all remember that stu biblical stewardship? You know what else is, 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 is stewardship? Voting. Voting is stewardship. It's taking what, it, it, it's, it's taking what God has given us, the privilege, the honor, the obligation to vote. Our biblical convictions. Deuteronomy 1.13 describes the importance of choosing wisely when we do cast our ballots. Choose wise and discerning and experienced men from your tribes and I will appoint them as your heads. This is why Christians must exercise their civil liberties to bring about change, to empower people who represent the ways of God in government and ultimately in laws. Listen to what Samuel Adams, not, not the beer, so calm down. Because if believe it or not, for those non-historians, Samuel Adams, Adams was a person. And this is what he said. Let each citizen remember at the moment of his offering, uh, at the moment he is offering his vote, that he is not making a present or a compliment to please an individual. Or at least that he ought not so to do. But that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. See, as Christians, we are to respect government, but know that no president or elected official will provide everything we are looking for. Our salvation is not found in the White House. Let's find comfort in Psalms 146, three through five. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirits departs. He returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. How blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord of his God. You see, no politician, no political party, no president will or can meet our, all our needs. Political promises, believe it or not, they will be forgotten. Expectations will go unmet because we live in a fallen world. That's really the message of Ecclesiastes. Our hope and our help come from the Lord, not man. As Christians, we are to respect government, but know that God is sovereign. In every election, things change. Every election, things change. But one thing is constant. You know what that thing, that one thing is? God is on his throne. Amen, amen, amen. And, and I chewed on that because I've seen that a lot on social media. I've seen that a lot. So I had to chew on that because it, it's not wrong. He's absolutely, praise God for that. But that's not a consolation prize for when your candidate doesn't win. Let me repeat that for those that are slow of hearing. 
This, that statement, that promise, that truth that God is on his throne is not a consolation prize for when your candidate does not win. Because that's really, really when you hear it the loudest, when your candidate loses. Well, God is still on his throne. You don't think he was before? You don't think he is after? He is going to be always on the throne. And it's almost like a shot at people. Like a, like, like, like a dig. It's like a get back. God is on the throne regardless of who is president. You know, in the middle of his lament over the loss of Jerusalem, Jeremiah wrote these words in Lamentations 3, and this is verses 22 and 23. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, if you know your biblical history, Jeremiah was, was lamenting or crying because the Jews had been taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. And I'm like, you know, be, why? Why were the Jews taken away? Again, because they disobeyed. But there was a, two, two promises that came out of this. Well, there was multiple, but two promises that I want to talk about. First is God told Jeremiah, hey, hey, buy this land in Jerusalem. Jeremiah's like, well, hold on. We all got exiled, but you only buy some land in Jerusalem. So he bought some land. Second thing is, God said this. He said this in, in, in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. He also promised a righteous king in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That promise, the promise of Jesus, was not on our ballots. The promise of Jesus and his coming was not on the ballot for president. So don't look for, for them guys. That doesn't fulfill the promise of these. It fulfills the ultimate promise, but it doesn't fulfill this promise. God will accomplish his purpose regardless of who is president. Throughout history, God has used a wide range of individuals to fulfill his will. He used Abraham, Moses, Noah, David, David, great when he was little, but then he had that little, you know, that little valley. He used David. He used Cyrus and Caesar, Nebuchadnezzar and Nero. He has worked out his purpose under every condition imaginable. From Egypt to Babylon to Rome, from world wars to elections, he is working out his purpose. We might think that things have, have slipped and been taken out of our hands. Well, here's the first thing. It was never in our hands to begin with. But they have never been taken out of God's hands. Proverbs 21 one says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Psalms 22, 28, For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. As Christians... We are called to be the best citizens. We are called to be the best citizens. Paul tells us in Ephesians and Galatians, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Galatians 6.10, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. If we treat each other bad, it's like, it's like this. And I, my parents, I know, I know you've said it because I've said it. Listen, you better, you better treat your brother and sister right. Because if, if you don't treat your brother and sister right, you're going to get outside and your friends and, and, and people are going to see how you treat your brother and sister. They're going to think it's okay for you to treat them like that, for them to treat it like that. Y'all heard that before, right? 
If we don't treat our brothers and sisters the way God has called us to treat each other, what's the outside? What's the world going to do? They're going to treat them just like we treat them because they're going to think, oh, it's okay. That's how they do. But we need to be the best citizens. Romans 12, 21 puts it this way. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there is, there might be a person who voted differently than you. He, that person is not your enemy. Even if you think they are, what are we called to do? Love our enemies. Yeah, but, nah. Yeah, but's not in the Bible. Not, not there, at least. So, how many in here, uh, raise a hand. How many of you in here have heard or read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Screw Tape Letters? Okay, for those that have it, that's okay. So, the Screw Tape Letters, it, it, it re we read of an older demon named Screw Tape, right? And, and he's writing to his young understudy, Wormwood. So, you have Screw Tape, who's like the mentor, and he's writing letters to his understudy, Wormwood. And these letters are filled with strategies to knock Christians off track. What do you think Screwtape would write to his understudy Wormwood about the political climate of today? Well, we don't need to guess. Let me, let me read what I think he would write. My dear Wormwood, be sure that the patient, that's the Christian, remains completely fixated on politics. Arguments, political gossip, and obsessing on the faults of people they have never met. This serves as an excellent distraction from advancing in personal virtue, character, and the things the patient, the Christian, can control. Make sure to keep the patient in a constant state of angst, frustration, and general disdain towards the rest of the human race. In order to avoid any kind of charity or inner peace from further developing. Ensure the patient continues to believe the problem is out there in the broken system rather than recognizing that there is a problem within themselves. Keep up the good work, Uncle Screwtape. That's exactly what's going on right now. We are fixated on the goings-on of, 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 of our politics. And that's, that's not just, that's not, United States doesn't own the monopoly of this. I mean, you see it worldwide. It's happening all over the place. You see it on commercials where they're trying to make Jesus some kind of, of woke teacher or, or, or something like that. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and not let the distractions of the world interfere with our job as Christians. You see, as Christians, our commitment must be to the great commandment and the great commission. Love your God with everything we have. Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. We need to love others as we love ourselves. The second is this. You shall love your neighbors as, neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So, quick question. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody the person that you don't agree with politically, the person you don't agree with uh, 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 theologically, the person you don't agree with, how they park next to you and they ding your car, it doesn't matter. You are called, we are called to love everyone. You see, if we say we love God, then we will love others. John talks about this in his letter in 1 John, and he warns us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. How can you say you love God and hate your neighbor? How can you say you love God, but you won't share the gospel with your enemy? 
The third is make disciples of the nations. We show that we love God and love others by sharing the gospel to the lost, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And I won't read that, you see it there. Remember, we are to live on mission as we, as we proclaim the gospel to our neighbors and the nation. Today, this morning, are you more worried about someone's po politics or where they're going to spend eternity? Are you looking to have a political conversation or a gospel conversation? The world wants to divide us according to our political affi affiliation. But see, our task is to share Jesus with people, not to prove that our political views are right. Often we get worked so worked up that we forget our role is to be a witness. Remember, if Jesus said we would be known as his disciples by our love for one another, what does it tell the people around us when we are hostile and divisive toward everyone else? We should be challenged by Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let our speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each other. Church, this is our moment. This is our moment. Let's live as missionaries in the midst of the lost world. We are called to be missional, not political. So let's love God, love people, and reach the world. So what do we do? We need to keep politics in perspective. When we see leaders doing things, when we start having questions that we don't understand, or we see people getting elected we don't know how, that we either agree with or don't agree with, we need to put all that in perspective and hold true to the promise of Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So let's put our politics in perspective. There will be no end to the increase of his government or, his, or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Our hope is not in the president. Our hope is not in Congress. Our hope is not in the Supreme Court. Our hope is in the coming king. When Jesus returns, he will set up a one-party system with him as Lord of all. For, uh, Revelations 1 and 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. We must recognize that there are two kingdoms in conflict. When Jesus was arrested and taken before Pilate, he spoke of another kingdom in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. And my kingdom were of this world. Then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate became very frustrated by, by Jesus' response. And so he said, so Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and have authority to crucify you? And I love how Jesus answered you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. We act like these cats have all the power. They, they have limited power because God is the ultimate power. You see, Jesus is continuing to build his spiritual kingdom. This kingdom is in conflict with earthly kingdoms. But as Christ followers, we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. Philippians 3:20 For our citizenship for our citizenship is in heaven from which we are also we eagerly wait for a savior the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2:11 Beloved I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Remember a personal conversion through Christ not a political conviction will lead to lasting change. So let's get back to the text, Ecclesiastes 8. 
Another principle to keep us grounded is to revere God. We are called to revere God. The call to fear God is found throughout the Bible. The importance to revere God, it's important to revere God regardless of whether we agree with the government or not. Ecclesiastes 10 and 11, so then I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out of the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Solomon was disturbed. Solomon was, was, was so weary when he saw the wicked giving beautiful funerals and eulogies. He was troubled when he observed how consequences were not enforced. As he thought about it, he came to the same conclusion that he had many times before. Although a sinner does, an evil, does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well with those who fear God who fear him openly, but it will not be well for the evil man and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow because he does not fear God. We must remember that to fear God is to revere God. Proverbs 9, 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So you wanna experience and you wanna re reflect godly wisdom, then revere God. You want to have and experience godly wisdom, then fear the Lord. True wisdom starts with a reverent awe and respect for God, recognizing his holiness, authority, and sovereignty. A proper reverence of, for God enables us to find joy even in life's frustrations. You know, I spoke about this some time ago about how we need to revere God, but there's no reverence for God. There's no reverence for the word of God. We, we, we look at it as secondary. So in, 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 if you've ever taken an English class or written a research paper, there, there's, there's certain types of sources, right? You have primary sources, and then you have secondary sources. And, and so we treat God's word as a secondary source, but we, 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 we treat uh, 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 policies and we treat Fox and we treat CNN and MSNBC as primary sources. Those aren't primary sources to my eternity. This is the primary source and really the only source that we need. But we've lost reverence for God. We, I mean globally, right, Christians and, 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 and the church, especially the American church, has lost reverence for God because we put our politics or our likes or our dislikes ahead of this. Ecclesiastes 8 through 14, 8, 14 through 15 points out the frustration in living in a fallen world where injustices go unchecked, where they seem to go unchecked. But know this, when we revere God and acknowledge his sovereignty, we can experience joy and only the joy that he gives. Finally, principle four is to remain faithful. Even when we do not know what will happen or why things do not always make sense, we are called to remain resolute in our faith. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, and I saw every work of God concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though a wise man should say, I know he cannot discover. God, God's ways are often mysterious and difficult to understand. That's why we're reminded three times to, that we cannot discover or we cannot find out. This statement means that we often will struggle to try to put the puzzle together, a puzzle that we cannot put together. Church, no matter what happens, we are to remain faithful as 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Regardless of who's president, regardless of who's senator, regardless of who's congressman, regardless of who's governor, regardless of who's on the school board, regardless of a mayor, regardless of judges, trust God. That's what we're called to do. Trust God. Trust his sovereignty, trust his goodness, trust his power, trust his plan. We are to hold fast to Jesus and to his word. Hold fast to his promises. Promises found 
like this that are found in Revelation 2.25. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. You see, it's only through a personal conversion through Christ and not a political conviction that will lead to lasting change. I'm going to ask the band to come up at this time. As Christians, we are called to reflect godly wisdom. We are called to respect government. We are called to revere God. We are called to remain faithful. You know, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was asked if God was on his side. This is his response. He said, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Lincoln then called our divided country to a national day of prayer, fasting, and humility, because America had become intoxicated with unbroken success. He said, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. We have become too proud to pray to the God who made us. He said, it behooves us then to humble ourselves, to confess our sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness, to pardon us of our national sin and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former, former happy condition and unity of peace. In light of that, and you start playing low for me. In, in light of that, Jeremiah 29, 6, 29, 7 says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile. That's what Jeremiah said. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will have welfare. Jeremiah is telling those in exile, hey, where you're at right now, pray for, your, pray for those leaders. We as Christians, are to pray for our leaders. Why would you pray for our presidents to not be successful? God had or has ordained them to be in the position they're in, not based on your preferences. Because we will experience welfare when there is welfare in the land. You know, before the election, a survey was taken about how people felt. And here's some of the responses and the words that described how many were feeling. Fear, anger, distrust, frustration, embarrassment, apathy, anxiety, sadness, hostility. Here's the thing. People will continue feeling this way as long as they rely on government and man to meet their needs. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalms 118, 8 and 9. 8 and 9. For it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It, has, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. No government, no policy can address humanity's deepest problem. And that's sin. Government can't fix that. Policy can't fix that. Law can't fix that. Only Jesus can fix that. <laughs> Salvation and eternal life comes only through Jesus. Church, what we need is a revival. A revival of Christian men and women who are unashamed and unapologetic of proclaiming the gospel to the world. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have never accepted the free gift of eternal salvation, what is stopping you? Are you waiting for the next president are you waiting for the next elected official? You're not going to find salvation there. I'd ask that you stand at this time. If you've walked away from God, what is keeping you from repenting and coming back? Church, let us walk as citizens of heaven, deeply rooted in the word, steadfast in love, committed to make disciples of the nations. 
Jesus reigns now and he reigns forever. Let's live in a way that declares this truth to a divided world. As we leave today, let's commit to being the light to the world. Let's be the lighthouse that this world needs where we reflect the hope and unity found in Christ. Yeah, we talked about post-election post reflections, but it comes down to this. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Or do you have a relationship with your political party? If you don't know Jesus this morning, Pastor Matt's gonna be down here, I'm gonna be down here. We wanna pray for you. If, if you're feeling anxiety and angst and, and worry and, you, and, and you're, you're just wringing your hands and you don't know what to, to, to do, come to the altar. Give it to God. He is our refuge. He is, 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 is our safety. He is where we go when we don't know. If you're a Christian and you've walked away, what a better time to come back than right now. Maybe you're a visitor and, and you've been coming for some time and, and you want to join the church. There's multiple ways to do that. You could go to our one-on-one, -on -one, but ultimately it, it, it takes the public profession. Not only, you know, I'm not trying to liken it to the baptism, but why would you not want to be a part of this fellowship or a fellowship? Come down here. Let's pray about it. Let, it, let me introduce you to the family of God. Let me introduce you to the family of Believers Fellowship. If you're hurting, if you have a medical condition, if, if, if one of your family, if your relationship's not right with your family, your husband, your wife, your kids, whatever, whatever, come now and pray. Whatever it is, this is your time. We will stay as long as you need us to stay and lift you in prayer. Yeah, we're going to eat, but the food can wait. It's time to do the business of God. Don't walk out of here and say, God, if I only. Thou is the only. Because you, you, we're not promised our next breath. Well, we are promised we will stand before our Heavenly Father one day. And we will have to account for all of our words, all of our actions, all of our deeds. And we will hear one of two things. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Welcome into the arms of your master. Or depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Stop playing church. Stop playing to be a Christian. If you don't know Jesus, let me introduce you to him today. If you've walked away, come back. He's waiting with open arms. If you're a Christian and you've walked away, remember, nothing can pluck you from his hand. You are sealed by the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. Father, I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for your providence, Father. Father, you ordained this centuries ago, Father. You knew we would be right here, Father, in need of a Savior, Father. And I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, who died, lived a sinless life, died for my sin, so that I could spend eternity with you, Father. I thank you for the struggles, Father, I thank you for the turmoil. I thank you for the medical conditions. I thank you for, for the valleys, Father. Because it's in those valleys, Father, that we truly come face to face with you and realize that we can't do this thing called life without you, Father. So I thank you, Father. I thank you that you reveal to us, that you shine your face on us, Father, and you soften us, Father. I pray that when we leave here, we, 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 we are Jesus to those that need you, Father. That we boldly proclaim your word, Father. We thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come. Come. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, yes, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name Shine through the shadows, burn like a 
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. We shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is love. Every stronghold shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through. I just want to speak the name of Jesus, Jesus. We just want to speak the name of Jesus. We're just going to speak the name of Jesus. Everybody speak the name of Jesus, Jesus. Every strong heart 
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Round of applause for Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to share my heart with you this morning. Uh, man, I miss Joe. Uh, Camille, love you. Praying for you. I know a lot still in the air, uh, but God's in control. And, and so uh, whenever you leave, just know we're going with you. Maybe not physically, but in spirit, we're going to be there with you. And so I love you, sister. You mean more to me than you know. So I truly, truly love you. Uh, before Pastor Matt comes in with the closing announcements, we are going to eat. So parents with kids that are three feet and lower, watch your kids. We've got a lot of people that look up, don't look down. And I don't want anybody here breaking a hip. Um, and, and also, you serve your kids, okay? Just let's do that. So you take care of your kids. And, and, and like I said, if you're three feet and under, have them hold your pocket, hand, whatever. Um, but let's do everything in an orderly. We don't, like I said, I don't want anybody getting hurt today. So Pastor Matt, come on up. So our first announcement, we have Miss Sophia coming up to make an announcement. Okay, we'll go down there. Even better. Good morning. I shouldn't be saying this. I didn't get permission. <laughs> I just want to um, piggyback off what Pastor Gary said um, at the beginning of service and tell you all how much you mean to us and how much we appreciated your love, your texts, your emails, um, your encouragement over the last month, um, but really over this last year. We were talking over the weekend how humble um, that we truly are, that God called us to ministry, and he called Gary to be the pastor over this flock. We love y'all, and we thank you from the bottom of our, of our hearts um, for all that you do for us, for your encouragement, and um, your steadfast and just support of us. We could not do life without you. And so we, just from the bottom of my heart, thank you for loving my husband and your pastor. Thank you. I wasn't supposed to say that, so sorry. Um, I'm supposed to get up here and be excited about this next um, announcement. So let me, let me, hold on. Okay. <laughs> so ladies, I'm super excited about our encourager. Some of you have been coming to this event for Gosh, I can't even remember how long we've, we've been having it. But it really is a night of fellowship. So we have our encourager. It's um, on December 13th at 630. We're going to have it here in the sanctuary. This is a no-cost event. Please, please come out. Invite your friends, your family, your neighbors. Um, we are going to have praise and worship led by our very own um, ladies by Kiss by Grace. So we're excited that they're going to be with us that night. It's going to be a, a night of, of fellowship, of worship. Um, please bring your favorite holiday appetizer or dessert to share. Um, we're also doing a sock exchange this year. So a couple of years back, I think we did an ornament exchange. Um, I actually I saw, I saw this idea, but I also saw some of the kids do it a, a few years back in, in Aiden's little friend circle, and it was fun. But we're asking that you 
bring a pair of new socks um, that are stuffed with whatever you want to put stuffed stuff socks um i said the max is ten dollars but some of you have come back and said that's not even enough so i'm trying to be um conscious of people having budgets so i ask that you not go over at least 15 to 20. i understand but i put 10. um so please bring your socks your stuffed socks we are also if anybody is interested in decorating a table Please see Miss Pam after the service. We do have a sign-up sheet in the lobby, um, and we are excited for you to come out. Youth girls, youth girls, I highly encourage you to come out. Just because we're old, we still know how to have fun, and we would love for you to come out and fellowship with us. So please invite your friends. Please feel like you're a part of this event because you are, and we are honored um, to be your sisters in Christ, so I invite you out too. Thank you. Thank you. And so tonight we do have our Awana Thanksgiving parties as well as our youth Thanksgiving parties at 515. And so if you have children or your family has children or your neighbors has kids, even though they haven't been coming here normally, we would like for them to be here at 515. That's for our children and our youth. And we have a guest speaker coming tonight for our youth. So you'd want them to be a part of it. It's going to be a great time. Now, there are no lift today. There's no ladies lift today or next Sunday as well. We have no morning and afternoon lift groups tonight or next Sunday. Now, this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, you don't want to miss it. Brother Mike Miller is going to be here. He's going to be leading service. So he's going to bring a word from the word, and it's going to be a great message. So you don't want to miss it. Be a part of that. It's going to be great. Now, we have our annual winter kids lock-in coming up this December 7th. It's for for children who are grades 1st through 6th. The cost is only $15, guys. We're going we're gonna to house your kids for six hours. We're going to feed them. We're going to wear them out so when they get home, they're, they're going to go right to sleep for $15. You can't beat that. So <laughs> you can sign them up online starting today. In the lobby, there's those flyers with the QR code. You can scan that. Get them signed up. It's going to be a great time. For our guests, if you're a guest here today, if you filled out that welcome card in the seat right in front of you, Pastor Gary has a gift that he would like to put in your hand. So meet him in the lobby here in just a little bit, as well as our online guests. Again, if you go to bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab. There's a little bit of information there. Guys, don't forget your tithes and offerings. We, we do so much because we're all so generous in, in understanding that everything that we have is because of God. And so we can give multiple ways. You can give in person. You can give online at bfshirt.com. You can give through the app. You can give through the mail. But don't forget to, to be honor, to honor God with our giving. And finally, we do have our youth, our youth. We, we have our church-wide Thanksgiving meal here in just a moment. So I'm going to close in prayer. But what I'm going to ask us to do is let's go out the doors, go towards the fellowship hall, and form a line in the hallway rather than in the fellowship hall because it will get pretty crowded in there. But let's form a line, and it's going to be a great time. But right now, let's close in prayer for the mill. Father God, we come to you right now, Lord. We thank you for the mill that we're about to receive. Lord, we do ask that you bless this food and nourishment to our bodies to give us the strength for the day. God, we thank you for the service today, for the word that's made an impact on so many lives. For those who, who it has touched, that, that you've spoken to them to, to do something, Lord, we do ask that, that you move in them and, and continue to work on them this week. But God, we ask that you bless this time, this time of fellowship and time of meal. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, you are dismissed. <laughs>